The more satellites you have up there, the more pixels that are collected of the Earth's surface every single day, there become more products that you can actually build and more use cases that you can unlock. My big idea is really around building verticalized Earth observation tools. Um, I think there's been a lot of work over the last decade or so to actually get a lot of Earth observation sensors and set up the infrastructure to send pixels down to Earth from space, which is really a remarkable task. For 2025, I'm really excited to see entrepreneurs really build verticalized so solutions that go into different industries and actually solve customer problems. There has been a boom in Earth observation satellites going up. What's really driving that growth? I think the first off is, is launch costs and really access to space. In decades previously, it was very, very difficult and expensive to send satellites up to, to orbit. Um, these days, it's, it's honestly getting as easy as sort of like a bus service um, with, with things like SpaceX's transporter launch service. So the cost per kilogram of satellites getting to orbit has really, really come down. Satellites have changed a lot in the last few decades. They're no longer school bus sized, $100 million per unit satellites. They've come down to the sizes of a loaf of bread. With that, you get a lot of proliferated sensors. You get a lot of coverage over the earth and, and costs have really remarkably um, sort of come down. And then I think the last thing I would point to is communications infrastructure. There's been a lot of work to set up ground stations and to actually have satellites communicate with each other in space to have a more efficient way to send pixels down to the earth. And so as we think about those economics, and if the economics have come down so much on getting the satellite up there, how does that ultimately ladder to the applications that can be built and the economics around that? To me, it's a really exciting positive flywheel here. The more satellites you have up there, the more pixels that are collected of the Earth's surface every single day, there become more products that you can actually build and more use cases that you can unlock. Prices sort of come down, and that allows and unlocks entrepreneurs to, to really cheaply solve problems for, for the entire Earth at once. Since we're talking about economics, maybe you can give listeners a sense of what those are. Like, how much does it cost for us to get this data, process it, or for real-end applications to be made? So, so the unfortunate answer is that it depends a little bit. Broadly, there's actually a, a huge amount of, of freely open data. So NASA's Landsat program provides free open data for the entire Earth. The European Space Agency has Sentinel, which also provides free data. And then there's a lot of commercial companies as well who provide medium resolution. The prices range in the sort of dollar to five dollars per kilometer squared. Oh, wow. um, and so that's really not too expensive. And then it gets tends to be more expensive as you go up into the high resolution 30 and 10 centimeters per pixel. Um, but those are typically for, for more specialized uh, use cases. It's not very well known that it's even could be this cheap. Um, and, and there's a whole suite of archive data that goes back years and years from these companies who, who have collected data from orbit every single day for, for years and years. That's kind of a gold mine waiting to be really leveraged. Yeah. And we've seen different private entities, public entities, governments, universities really pour in resources to get a lot of this data. But Speaking of the applications that in some cases do already exist, what are some of those? There have been some really, really exciting um, applications so, so far. I think agriculture is most talked about. Farmers across the world are, are really using Earth observation data to monitor their crops, predict crop yields, understand ways in which that they need to irrigate or fertilize their crops to really produce better outputs here. Other applications include defense. Governments across the world use it to monitor things like troop movements, um, ships and ports fleets of, of their equipment across the world, energy use as well. Mm. There's a lot of interesting work that can be done in forecasting clouds and large scale grids and, and looking at like how much solar production will happen on any given day, planning of utility scale um, mm -hmm. solar farms, like looking at land and, and where you can actually place utility solar farms. As we think about where we are in that arc, obviously this is your big idea for 2025. Why do you think this maybe has been underexplored to date? You know, I think it's really, really difficult. And I think that companies are making it a lot easier these days. I mean, uh, you know, it's it's sort of a new thing that you can even go on to a website and, and buy an image right. um, through a portal. You used to kind of only be able to talk to a salesperson mm. um, to be able to do that. There's a lot of open source work. There's a lot of companies kind of chewing off different parts of the puzzle. The main thing in my eyes uh, that I'm looking forward in the next year to two years is entrepreneurs actually going into specific industries and really taking solutions vertically. So in one sense, if you take something like uh, SpaceX and they have Starlink and they're the ones who create the satellite, put it up there, and then also sell the, the data mm -hmm. that people can use. Are you basically saying that you expect to see more of that specific solutions for, let's say, like you said, agriculture or energy instead of one company putting the satellite up there and then other companies in the middle 
distributing that data, processing it, et cetera? It has traditionally been hard for incumbents and, and actual satellite manufacturers to go into industries like agriculture and really get granular in terms of solving mm. problems. Just an example of that would be like automating, you know, any sort of like farming sort of equipment. It's hard for a, an existing earth observation player to go really, really vertical all the way straight from, right. from orbit to the farm. Um, and, and right now that's traditionally stopped somewhere around providing uh, analytics or insights. Um, but I'm looking for in the future to actually provide automation. And, and maybe we can drive a lot of that farm equipment for instance, or, you know, um, actually irrigate fields directly through a closed loop Earth observation. Maybe a follow up there is we've obviously seen a bunch of machine learning and AI tools come up in this last few years. Does that change the game in terms of being able to parse data, process it, make sense of it for these, you know, verticalized players, for example, or how does that really reshape the ecosystem? Certainly, yeah. I mean, terabytes and terabytes come down from from Earth or from orbit uh, every single day. Um, soon to be probably petabytes. Wow. We don't have enough humans on the Earth to actually look at all those images. So yeah. um, we really need advanced techniques here. A really famous example a couple of years ago where a company actually found the, the Chinese spy balloon through training their model with AI prediction of, of exactly what the, the balloon might look like. Okay. And they were able to sort through pictures of the entire U.S. taken like over days and days and actually track down the source for wow. the first time. So, uh, you know, we really can't do that with humans. And uh, I think new use cases like this will be unlocked every every year. And as we think about maybe the roadblocks or the challenges that may be on the road to us, really like this earth observation economy, you could say, pr mm -hmm. proliferating, what are those? One of the most pressing is how difficult it is to, to work with the data, I think, right now. Typically, it, it still requires specialized knowledge of orbits and different types of sensors and how they are sort of calibrated and uh, correlated. And, and I think it's it's not so easy to apply techniques from one Earth observation constellation to another right mm -hmm. now. We almost might need some sort of middleware here where we can kind of abstract away the, the nuances of, of each Earth observation constellation and, and make um, data sets that are really sensor agnostic um, and more and more frictionless for for non-space engineers to use. Changing this from a very specialized like, climate scientist, GIS scientist, to any sort of ML engineer can kind right. of start to use these, these uh, techniques. What about regulation? I mean, I think about maybe regulation mostly impacting the satellites that go up there, but maybe you could give us a more wider perspective of, like, is regulation hindering us at all, whether it is to get the satellites up there or utilize the data, proliferate yeah. it, et cetera? Yeah, there's been a lot of exciting um, regulation changes recently. I, I think most famously, NOAA agency lowered the restriction for the maximum commercial resolution from 30 centimeters per pixel to 10 centimeters per pixel very recently. So this kind of unlocks like a lot more higher resolution products. And there's a whole suite of applications that you can start to target. On the imagery sort of side, I, th I think that there's been a lot of conversation about licensing Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, different data sort of rights. Uh, right now, there's there's a lot of complex contracts where um, customers will buy exclusivity and there'll be 24 hours where nobody else can can access an image. Yeah. And, and it's it really kind of hinders, you know, folks that are trying to to build products for, you know, with like daily applications or yeah. daily monitoring. So I think licensing and, and kind of like opening up archive data and making it sort of easier and less restrictive to, to sort of use could be a good sort of regulation um, change as well. Where are you looking next year and what applications in particular do you find really exciting as we look toward the future? I'm really excited, honestly, about the energy sector. We already touched on sort of like predict predictive analytics for for solar farms. There's a lot of work with like renewable wind um, sort of sources as well. So I, I think like I'm just looking for for entrepreneurs to take Earth observation and really solve our most pressing sort of challenges with um, with these new data sets and, and things that are coming online right now. <laughs>